So in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about advanced WPF concepts. So I'm going to go ahead and run the sample application that I've created for you and just kind of go through each section on what we're going to learn. So the first section is going to be on simple binding. And so what we're going to learn of this in WPF is how we can bind one element to another. So for example, I've got this list box here, and I've got some labels right here, and then a text box. Now this is all done in WPF. So if I were to click this list box, you can see that these labels are bound to it, and so is the background color of these other ones. And this was all done in XAML, passing the data back and forth. For binding collections, you can see here, this is kind of what, we, what we're used to in our collections, where I've got a list box. It's bound to a list of objects that you've overridden the toString method. And so it just shows the data like this. And so we know kind of what that looks like in the past. And that's fine. But with WPF, we can really take advantage of the power that it holds, where this exact same list is also bound to this list box here. But notice the difference on the colors and how they look. And so for this one, you can see there's actually two rows for a given element, for a given object. The first row kind of shows the name, and that has a label, job title, the actual data engineer for their job, job level, and then you can see the job level, number of years that go down like that. And so this just kind of shows you another way that you can display the same data, just that power of WPF. Here we're just going to show you how to bind some data to WPF. Here we're showing you the auto-generate auto columns to true. Here we're showing you where we're actually creating the custom columns ourselves. This here is what's called the row details template and where we've bound a list to this data grid. But when you click on a given row, there's actually sub details that pop up for each given row. And this can be look any way we want. We'll kind of show how we do this. So what's happened here is there is a list of objects. Each row is an object. However, this object also has a list of objects within it. And that's what's being displayed here. The last one has to do with this I notify property changed for a data grid. And so up to this time, what we've done is, is we've just bound entire lists and just deleted objects or added objects. And we're going to learn about how to update the UI and how to update the UI for individual properties. So for example, if I do this, it would change it actually in the lot list behind the scenes. Or if I click this button, it updates the list, which then updates the UI automatically. If we were to use a regular list, this would not work. And we'll talk about how all this is put together. So let's just go ahead and start. And the way I've broken up this lecture is per tab. So if you look at the XAML here, if you just go through each of these tab items, that's the different sections we're going to be talking about. So first, let's talk about binding in WPF. So you'll notice, let's just kind of walk through here. We've got a stack panel that has a text box in it and a list box. And this is really the key here is this list box. And see, it's called LB color for list box of color which has a bunch of list box items in it that have the various colors set for their content. Below that, we have a text box here. And now we're going to get into the binding of data. So now we've got this text block right here. And what we want to have happen is as the user selects one of these items from the list box, we want that text right here to show right here. So we're saying, hey, user, you've selected this one. Now, we could have done this in code. This would have been fairly simple. We could have just handled the selection changed event and then got the selected item, did a two string, and displayed it in this text box. But we could also just bind it in WPF and have it do it for us. So here's our text block. Now we're going to access the text block's text property. Now remember, everything in XAML is just a class behind the scenes in C Sharp. So you could do all this in C Sharp code. So we're accessing the text block property. Now what we want to say is we want to bind our text property to our list boxes selected item dot content. So you see how this is, so if it selected this list box item, we want it to select blue. If it was this one, we want it to select yellow. And this is just the text property is all we're going to show for this one. So we have what's called the binding class. Now remember, everything here is a C-sharp class. So this is a text blocks class. This is the property for the text property. And this is a new binding class that we're binding into this text property. And so what we use with this binding class is first we say, which element are we binding to? Well, we're going to bind to this list box here called LB color. 
Well, what do we want to bind? What property, what path of the property we want to bind to? Well, the selected item dot content. Now, this can feel a little bit clunky in the sense that it's not really hasn't have IntelliSense built into here and you can see how you have to actually just type it and you have to know so you just have to get the syntax correct it can take a little fumbling and also this can be confusing a lot of times I forget this exact ten syntax and I have to go back to my example so please don't feel like you don't understand it and that everyone else does that's just not the case even I forget the syntax because usually I'm designing out my UI and then, uh, so I understand all this really well, and then I work on all my code for years, and so I kind of forget exactly how all this syntax works. But that's how it is. You create this binding class, here's the element we're binding to, and here's the path of the property that we're binding to from that. So that's how this first one, if I run this, when I select a color, you'll see that it sets blue right here for my text blocks text property. So now let's go down to the next one. So this exact syntax, is also right here and this is sort of the shorthand for it anytime you see these brackets you kind of know binding is going on there's some objects that you're that are going to get set within this text property so I wanted to do both of them so you could kind of see the longhand and the shorthand notation almost no one does it like this it's almost always done this way it's just easier to read and more concise so just like above we say our binding here's our element and here's our path so we're just setting those two properties for our binding class now again this is just a C-sharp class. We could have done all of this in code behind. I'm going to raise this up here just a little bit so we have a little bit more room. So for this next set, I have tried to put a big long comment here so that later on you can refer back to this to really understand about this, this binding and how it can go both ways. And so by default, this is what's called a one-way binding. And that means that it flows from our source down to our label. But there are other ways that we can do this. We can have what's called one time, one way to source, or two way. And I've kind of given some explanations of what each one is. So again, the default is this one way right here. So here's another text block. Now you can see the text property I'm binding to that list box, to the content, and I'm just hard coding in one way. It's exactly the same as above. But I'm also adding on the background property here. So now I'm saying my background I'm binding it also to my list box. It's also listbox.content not one way. Now here's the thing about WPF is it's smart enough to convert this value, that, that content value, it's smart enough to convert it to a background color, that brush. So it'll actually do that for me. That's why we saw it when I selected one, it actually does change it to the appropriate color. Now this next example is what's called two-way binding. So the binding will go back and forth between the, the source and the sub-element. So for our text, you can see I'm doing the exact same thing, except now I've set the mode to two-way. Well, the next property I have to set, if it's two-way, is when to set it. And there's this thing called update source trigger. And so you can see right here, I've set it to property changed. And what that means is, is that Whenever that a prop, whenever this property is changed, that's when that update is going to take place. And you can see the default is actually lost focus. You'd have to actually tab out of that control or something like that in order to get that property to update, to send that back and forth. Now for the background, you can see I've then just done the same thing and set that to one way. So now let's take a look at this in action as I run the code. So when I run this here and I select blue, or yellow, you can see that it's all bound here. But now, what if I actually typed something into this, such as green? See how it changes? But you can see how it's actually coming here and here. So anything I type, it's going to go both directions. So that's that two-way binding that we can do. So now let's take a look at this binding collections here, where we've got our two-string method, and then we've kind of displayed that same data differently over here. So I'm going to close down this tab item, open up this one, and let's first look at this list box here called list box incorrect. It's not really incorrect, but just a name I gave it. And so let's find it here. And you'll notice my item source is bound to this list of people one. And so both of those list boxes, both the list incorrect and this list correct are both bound to the exact same data. But the second list box 
has an item template set, which we'll talk about in just a second, and that's where the magic actually happens behind the scenes. But they're both bound to the exact same data here. So let's come up here, and so here's this list of people, and you can see I've got this observable collection of a list of people of CLS person one. Observable collection. So up to this point, we've kind of been using a list a lot. Well, a list is fine, but a list doesn't have built-in two-way communication. So what I mean by that is let's pretend that this list people is an actual list of CLS person objects. If I were to do this and then bind it like I am here, it would work just like it, it normally does. However, if after this line of code, I were to say to list of people dot add a new person, the UI would not automatically reflect that change. But because now I've used an observable collection, it has this built-in notification for you. So that if I ever add or delete objects from this collection here, the UI will automatically be notified of it and will then be displayed that new data. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at this person object. It's just down below here. And you can see it's very basic. It just has some public properties for name, job title, job level, number of years with the company, and here's that overload of the two-string method. Now what I want you also just to take a quick notice of is S name, S job title, S job level, and S number of years with the company. The specific syntax of these properties because we're going to refer back to them in just a second. So the first list box is calling this toString method in order to display this data. So that's how it displays and we've seen that before with our combo boxes and everything like that and it's fine just to display some normal string here but again why don't we display it so it's a little bit more helpful to the end user. So let's take a look at what we've done. So the only difference is this what's called item template. And so what the item template says is that for each item in my list box, go to this template and it's going to tell me how to display that object's data. And so what we do is for an item template, we create what's called a static resource. They're both static and dynamic, but for right now, we'll just talk about static resources that don't change. So the resource itself will never change. It's static in memory. And we're pointing to this my list box data template. Let's take a look at this. So again, all of that in the UI is displayed differently because of this one line right here. So I come up here into my Windows resources. So I added this tag in because this is a resource of my window. I could also, if you wanted to have a resource global, you could put it in here in your application resources. So the difference being is that if you put a data template in here or any resource in here, it can be used globally if you put it here, it's used just for this window. So how do we define how we want this data to look in our text in our list box? And so hopefully you're starting to see the difference between uh, Windows Forms and WPF. Now, yes, there's a learning curve and it's a little bit more difficult, but after you do it a few times, it's not too bad and you can really make an application look more professional this way. So when we come into our data template, first we just name it. That's all this X colon key is. So you can name this anything you want. Now, the power of WPF, what it allows you to do is I can put anything I want in this template. So again, this is where your creativity has to come into play. Now, if you're like me, I'm an engineer at heart, and I'm very good at back-end programming, solving complex algorithms, but making something look pretty is where I struggle. Now, I will have later lectures that will talk about some basic concepts on how to make your UI look better, but I do recommend kind of going down that avenue and looking at applications, looking at web pages, the UI on your phone for different applications, and just think about what makes those applications good or bad as far as usability and just that visual aspects to them. Okay, so back to my data template. I invented this and I said, okay, first I want a grid. Grids are easy to work with and display the data in rows and columns. Okay, and since I've got this object with lots of data in it, it I thought a grid would work out well. So I've got this grid and I've just basically defined one column and two rows. So if I run this, you'll notice that there is one column and two rows. See the one row and the two row. Again, I could have defined it however I wanted. Now within that, I've got a text block here. Now what this text block is used for is I want to display the name of the person. So sorry, let me run this again so you can see. I want to display the name on this line 
and then I want to display all the sub data for this particular object here right so this is the this is the most important information this is the person's name and then here's their title their job level and their years with the company so you can see how I'm displaying an objects data with these various UI elements so how do I tell C sharp and this this uh, this template okay I've got this list box here's an item in this list box in this text block I want you to display the name well for the text property of my text block here's binding again and I'm saying bind that path to s name now this is a common point of confusion or a common programming error that I get a lot from students is that they forget that this right here s name has to match the property inside your class so see that UI element calls this public property so that it can display the name of the object and so that's what I've told it I've created this text block and I've said hey this text block display the name and then I just defined you know the font and the font weight and the back and the foreground you know you can do you can make this look however you want next I added in a stack panel again just made this up I said horizontal orientation and I've added a bunch more text blocks here now you notice this first one is just a regular text block it's just a it's just a label essentially and it just says job title the next text block is the one that's actually been bound to the job title the next one is the job level and the next one is number of years with the company so again you just have to make sure that these match the properties from your objects that are being bound to this data template and so hopefully you know you can now see just how much difference you can make your application look so let's go ahead and close this one down close this tab item down let's move on to the next one so this next grid here data grid we're just going to show you this auto generate columns and we're going to show you this auto generate columns to false where we're actually going to hard code in the columns now I'm going to show you behind the scenes how this actually doesn't update data and why that matters to us so here we go so now we're going to go work in this data grid this this grid item here and so I just put a text block on here nothing too exciting just kind of gives a basically a label now I've got my data grid where I've said auto generate columns to true and so let's take a look at our data grid default data grid so if I come back here you will notice that it's also bound to that list of people that we just looked at and sort of is this next data grid called custom columns so now this one because the auto generate columns is true it's going to use the same name of our properties right here that we use so notice s name job title job level so when I run this you can see there they are but generally we don't want the name of the properties displayed as the column headers we'd rather have something like this that's a little bit more user friendly so how do we do that well we come in here to our data grid but we set our auto generate columns to false so now our data grid is expecting us to define our data grid columns now this is going to look familiar in that we're essentially instead of a template we're setting up our data grid columns but we're still binding data so this is instantiates a data grid this is essentially saying um, D so you know DG custom columns dot columns dot add and then new data grid column new data grid column that's what really is going on behind the scenes in the C sharp that it generates for us so we add a new data grid text column give it a header and now I'm saying bind the path to my name property for this column so that's how it knows what data to display in this column and then same thing for the job title the job level and then number of years with the company so that's how I'm actually setting up that data I mean it was nice to get all of that done for us up here but again it looks a little more professional when you have those names set to you know user friendly all right the next tab item is this data grid details views so this one when we run it you'll notice that as I click each row it comes up with a sub data grid with other information about this given object so it actually lists out the company each co each company that this object this person has worked for in the past so let's take a look at that so here we go I've got my data grid I've set my auto generate columns to false like we just saw before set up my columns here's my data grid columns and you can see I'm binding everything the same just like I did above so nothing new here but now I'm going into my data grid dot row details template property and I'm telling it okay 
I want to set up how the rows should be displayed. Now you notice this is a template. This is exactly the same that we did up here in our Windows resources, just like here. And that means that we can set it to whatever we want. And again, this is where your creativity has to come into play. Now, before I, I show you this row details, what I'd like to do is let's go into our actual code now, because I'd like to show you how this object is actually set up. So let's come up here to the top. And so, generate columns, take a look, where's this at? Oh, there it is. Okay, so you'll notice this one is actually set to our list of people too. So let's take a look at that. So list of people two looks awfully familiar, just like up here, but instead of our person one class, we're gonna deal with our person two class. So it's gonna be slightly different than our person one class. So let's take a look at it. So we go to the definition. Now with this one, we've got the exact same properties that we had before for other person class, but now we're also adding in a list of companies that this person has worked for in the past. And so we're just adding in a list of CLS companies. So if I were to right click here, go to definition, it jumps me down, and you can see I've just got this public class that has company name, contact, and phone in it. And so I am creating this list of companies. Now in the constructor, I'm just adding in some companies here, just so we have some data to work with. And then I've got this public property called companies. Now this property is what we're gonna tie back to in our UI. So remember that name, companies. So we come back over here. Now, again, we could have defined our template at the, the window level or the application level, but we're just going to do it in line because maybe this is the only data grid we have and this is the only place we want to set this template. So we're going to create a data template, again, just like we did above, and we can do anything we want here. And I thought I would just keep it simple for our sake just so we can kind of move on with the example. And then I'm just going to create another grid with some rows and columns, and I'm going to put that data grid in it. Now what you'll notice is that this first column, I've moved it over 30 pixels and I've put my data grid into the second column. So if I run this, you'll see what that does. And that when I click this, see how it just moves it over a little bit? It just gave me some space because if this is right here, it looks really confusing just having this other data grid. Now again, you'd probably want to create some other kind of structures like a list box or, or something else, you know, like, like this here within here, but again, I just did it to, to keep it simple. And so what this is displaying is that company's data that we just looked at. But again, I could have created anything I wanted there. So we set our auto generate columns to false for our data grid, and then I just set up my data grid columns. Now, how does it know to show the companies right here? So for this data grid, it's bound to the company's property. Now, because it's already in that other data grid, it basically says, you know, data grid dot, you know, whatever that object is, dot companies. And so it drills it all the way down for you. And then I just set up those data grid columns just like I have any of the other ones. But I have to set it to these properties that are associated with those company objects. So just kind of a nice way that you can show a lot of information to the user for a given set of objects. So now let's take a look at this last tab item here. Now this one is really important to understand and it's a concept that a lot of people have trouble understanding, especially the first time through. You just have to kind of do it a few times and it'll start to make sense. And so what do we want to do with this notify, I notify property changed is that, okay, if I update data in my data grid, like if I set this to 10, what I want to have happen is I want this to set the data in the list that this is bound to. And also, this button right here, we'll take a look at a second, when I click it, it updates the list. So it updates that data. And see, so you notice how it actually, when I update the list, it actually gets reflected back in the UI. Now that's not because it's tied to an observable collection. It's because this new class that I'm about to show you has implemented what's called iNotifyPropertyChanged. Now what that means is, let, let's take a look in the code, I'll leave this up running, <clears throat> is when uh, I click this button, oh sorry, it's running, I could scroll down here, so here's this uh, button update data click. Now what you'll notice is that all I do is update the list. Now the observable collection works at the object level. So if I were to add or remove entire objects from this collection, this observable collection, it would be reflected in the UI. 
But what would not happen is if I just updated the properties for a given object, that would not be reflected in the UI unless I um, you know, implement what's called the I notify property changed. And that's what I'm actually doing. So when I bring this back up, again, when I clicked this button, it actually did update this with that I notify property changed. So let's see how all that works together. So in my UI, I've got my data grid. And so we'll come over here to DGI notify and we'll walk through its code. So first, we've set its item source to list people three. And you'll notice it's an observable collection just like we used before. It's another person object that has the same type of data set for it. So let's look at our person three. So if I come down here, you'll notice that now I don't have, I'm not using my auto implemented properties like I did above. I actually have these private variables and now I'm going to create public properties for each of these variables. So here's my first public property called name. It can, for the get, it returns the name attribute. But for the set, it does more than just set the value. What this code here does is it basically tells that data grid, hey, whatever, whatever control is bound, I'm bound to, something has changed. This name has changed. Therefore, you need to reflect that change. And that's what this does. So that when code like this is ran right here, it will actually update that code. And so this is what was going on. I think I skipped over that. So this is actually what was going on when I run this over here. When I click this button and you notice nothing updates over here. If I come over here, what it's actually doing is running this piece of code. And it is, no, see how it's updating the name, but the UI is not reflecting this hello right here. So no matter what I do, see how it's running that code? Even though it's running this, it's not shown on my UI. It's not changing any names. Where over here, when I update that, you can see it actually does update that from right here. So that's the difference between implementing this I notify property changed. So let's walk through this now. So first thing that has to happen is your class has to implement this interface called I notify property changed. Well, what does this mean? What does it mean to implement this interface? Well, this is you saying, I'm going to sign a contract with a compiler that I will implement this interface or I will code whatever it tells me I have to. So if I go to definition, you'll notice that it says in your class, you have to have an event called property changed event handler and the variable name property changed. So if we come over here, if I scroll down to the bottom of my class, here is where I'm meeting that contract with the compiler. You can see I've created a public event, property changed event handler, property changed, which is exactly this syntax here. So that's how I've met this interface. Now, I have to actually do something. It has an expectation in this property changed. What this event is, is the list box or the data grid or whatever, whatever UI, UI control is bound to this object it's going to actually assign a delegate to this event here. Just like when you have a button click and you assign a delegate to it that points to your button click method, that's it's kind of like the reverse here, where now you're creating the class, that UI element is actually going to pass in a delegate to its method to get called here. And so you're actually going to now call their method, and they're going to now know to update the UI. So let's, let's take a look at how this is all wired up here because nothing has been set here. We've just implemented the interface. We've created our event in our class, but we haven't done anything else with it. Now let's come back up here to this name. So get, we don't have to do anything for our I, I notify property changed. It's for the set that the UI cares. So we set our value. Now we do always want to make sure that our property changed is not null. Something could have happened, but it's just standard practice. You want to make sure that it's not null. Again, this is set by the UI. This is set by that control. In our case, the data grid. And now all we do is because this is an event, it just calls the method that they set this property changed to. Now you'll notice what is property changed? Like what is this method? So let's come down here. And you'll notice that we implemented this event property changed event handler. So if I were to right click on this, go to definition, 
Here's the delegate. So just like we had a button click delegate, there was a, a unique signature that had like, remember that object sender and then the event args? Well, this is the delegate signature that they want us to implement. So it has to pass in an object and also a property changed event args. This is the property. We're, we're telling them, hey, this property changed is what this is really saying. So for that, we're going to call this method that, again, they pass a delegate into this event so that we can call their method. Now, you'll know, remember, this first parameter is the object or the center. So it's saying, hey, which object changed? And that's how we that's why we pass in this, because this object is what changed. Next, it wants us to pass in a property changed event args. So that's what we're passing back to it is a property changed event args. So in here, we're just declare a new one. So this creates a new object. Again, you could have done this on multiple lines, but this is just a, a cleaner syntax. And you'll notice that if there's one property called or one parameter called property name. And so this needs to match the name of the property that changed. And so what this does is, is when we set the data up above, so if I scroll back up here, so on this line of code, notice how this calls the set property. So if I do go to definition, it calls the set, I set the value, and then I call the method that the UI element, the data grid has passed into me. I pass back to it the current object that's changed, and I tell it that the name property is the one that changed. So it knows to only ref update, it only has to update that one little box. Because now that doesn't, that seems trivial, but again, imagine you had a thousand or a million elements in this data grid. It wouldn't make sense to update every single one where you can just update one little box out of all of those elements. Now this same syntax you can now just copy and paste to your other properties. So you can see here's job title, property changed, I copied and pasted, and I changed this to job title. A very, very common bug is to forget to change this, so you'll have name in here. So you'll set the job title to something new, but it won't reflect it on the UI because you said the wrong property changed. Then there's job level, and then that sets that number of years the company, and then we've told them number of years the company has changed. So that is all because we implemented the I notify property changed. And that just allows the UI to know which property changed and to be able to reflect that change visually. So that's today's lecture. I know it's kind of a steep learning curve with WPF and these more advanced concepts, but after you go through them a few times, I think they'll start to sink in. Thanks.